In this podcast, I'm going to be going over some burning questions. I got some fascinating ones here. I'm going to be going over the best card shows and some wild experiences I had this weekend. And we are here for my podcast, episode number 29 of Beyond the Game. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Eric Michael. I've sold over $5 million in sports cards. And to this point in my life, I own a coaching program that does multiple seven figures a year, helping people make an income buying and selling sports cards. Sports cards are something I've been buying and selling for the past 10 years of my life, and it changed the course of my life forever. When I was 18 years old and I bought my first sports card of Steven Matz, used to be a prospect for the Mets, go look him up, made a few hundred dollars on the card and just changed my mindset, changed everything, and I truly do think sports cards is the best way to make a realistic income online. It's fun, you can be passionate about it, and who doesn't like sports and money? I mean, duh. Got it. But anyways, I'm going to start this off with some questions I got. And this is a this is a fascinating question. This is probably the best question someone's ever asked me on this podcast. So Raymond says, if you could go back eight years and give yourself one piece of wisdom about the sports card industry, what would it be? I like that question, Raymond. So This is, I'm not going to give you the obvious, right? Like if I was just saying the obvious stuff, all right, I would have held all Luka Doncic cards and Aaron Judge cards, right? That's like obvious, but that's not what we're talking about here because this is a lot of cards I bought, sold, got graded, made money on. I could have held and made boatloads of money, but there's also guys who I flipped for tons of money that are worth like nothing now, like Zion Williamson, Tyler Hero, like these guys used to sell for tons and tons of money. So aside from that, in terms of wisdom, the one piece of, so in terms of like making money in my strategy, it's actually always been pretty on point. So I had a mentor when I got into sports cards. So the way I got into sports cards, just to give you a little bit of a back story. So I'm from a town called Wayne, New Jersey. It's like 10, 15 miles south of New York City. And when I was in my senior year of high school, there was a kid from the other high school in my town that bought his own car, C-A-R, with $30,000. It was like a sports Toyota Corolla. His name was Dylan. And I got in contact with Dylan because I heard about this. And I was like, yo, how do you have $30,000? And he's like, I buy and sell sports cards. And at the time, keep in mind, this was 2015. Sports cards is not what it is today. And I remember I came home to my parents with the idea and they were like, you're an idiot. You're going to get scammed. Don't waste your money. But Dylan showed me you could buy these cards, send them to Beckett. That's where you send cards back in the day or modern cards and get them graded. And I did it once. I bought a card of Steven Matz, like I just mentioned before, for 500 bucks. Got it graded. It only took like a week. And he used to be a big prospect, like a big, big prospect. And pitchers used to sell for a lot of money. And I sold it for $888 on eBay a week later and it changed my life because I was delivering pizza, you know, making like 20, 30 bucks an hour, which wasn't bad. Honestly, I enjoyed delivering pizza, but now here I am. And all I did was click some buttons and I made $300 on one card. And I was like, well, if I can do this, do this with one card, why don't I buy three at a time or five at a time? And thanks to Dylan, Dylan always had me in the right mindset. Like don't hold cards, buy them, grade them, sell them don't guess, don't break boxes and packs. So fortunately for me, Dylan was is one of the, like even today, like 99% of people in sports cards don't make money, right? They open up boxes and cases. They just buy their favorite players. And same thing back then. I just got super lucky. There was someone in my town who I became friends with and this whole thing happened. So in terms of my strategy, coming to buying and selling, I was actually always good from that angle. However, the one thing I do regret, so growing, not growing up, but like from like 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, in these years, the way to move cards was something that I did a lot of was something called razzing, R-A-Z-Z-I-N-G, razzing. It's another word for raffle. And if you don't know what a razz is, this is the way it works. So let me try to paint this picture. So let's say you have a card worth $1,000. It may not be so easy to go and find someone that's going to give you $1,000 for it. However, there were these massive Facebook groups that used to be more popular back then, but not as much anymore. 
and they would do razzes. Ra they would just use the word razz, so they didn't use the word raffle on Facebook because Facebook probably doesn't want raffles being done on their platform. And this $1,000 card, instead of trying to sell to one person, they would divvy it up into 10 spots. You would post the card, and you would say, hey, this card of Mike Trout, 10 spots at $100 per spot, and people would comment, I want spot three, I want spot eight, I want spot five. Each person that takes a spot, you could take multiple spots if you'd like, would send $100 to you, so you get your $1,000 net, PayPal, Venmo, whatever, and the card would raffle through a, through a randomizer, like an organizer, and someone would, card would be raffled, someone would win it. Now, the way these groups would work, so I was somebody that would sell a lot of my cards through there, and if you sell a lot of cards, you want to give back, right? You know, I was probably selling twenty, thirty thousand dollars in cards a week, so I should be putting a little bit of not twenty thousand dollars worth, but like a thousand or two thousand dollars back into these raffles. And it's not really gambling because it's a pure form of gambling. Like if you take one spot, you have exactly a ten percent chance to win, as opposed to if you're gambling with a casino, right? There's they're taking juice from you. They're taking like it's not even odds to win. However, back in the day, I wasn't much of a gambler, which is funny because now, <laughs> now I'm a huge gambler and I love to gamble. But I didn't put money back into these groups. And also, I kind of came off like a total asshole, just to be frank with you. So, like, people would speak with me and they could tell, like, I was just there to make money. I wasn't there for the community. I wasn't there for friends. And because of that, a lot of people did not like me. And even today, <clears throat> I mean, now... People don't like me for different reasons because we run all these ads and, you know, all this content and people just don't like that. But that is the one thing I do regret, which is ironic because if you ever listen to any of my content, one of the things I say is be actually a good person, like build relationships, build friendships, because one, it's the right thing to do. And two, it actually makes you more money in the long run. One of the common things I say when people ask me, how should I sell my cards? I actually say sell it for five to 10% less to build relationships and build connections. Back in the day, like in 2016, 2017, 2018, when I was in college, I didn't do that. And it was still e it was still easy to sell cards. It still is. So like you don't need that, but it just makes your life easier. And I learned the importance of building connections and relationships and all that stuff through growing major league profits, right? They're two totally different types of like entities, right? Flip, sp flipping sports cards, it's simple. You're just flipping sports cards. It's yourself, you're buying cards, you're getting them graded, right? you're flipping them on Facebook, Instagram, wherever. Major League Profits is a full-on like business, right? There's like marketing and sales and coaches and operations people and hiring people and firing people and a recruiter and all this crazy stuff. And when you have that many people working for you, it's super important to build these relationships. And that's really where I learned it. Like the game of business, doing right by people, you actually make more money. And don't get me wrong, there's people that are assholes that make a lot of money. But doing right by people makes you more money, less stressful. And that is the one thing I do regret eight years ago, Raymond. That probably wasn't the answer you were expecting, but that's that's my answer to that. Carlos says, if you could only pick one strategy to get to $10,000 per month, would you pick sports? Oh, so you, Carlos, I think you're in the... Uh, one of my programs. So would you pick sports card flipping or the sports sports card betting, sports betting arbitrage and why? So what Carlos is referring to is, so in the program and like our highest level program, we teach people how to flip sports cards. And we also teach someone how to do something called sports betting arbitrage, where it's like a risk-free way of making a few grand a month. And if I wanted to make $10,000 per month, I would do both. So the sports betting arbitrage is an opportunity that caps out at like four or five thousand dollars profit per month, depending on the state you're in. But it's quick and it's easy and it's basically risk free. And in sports cards, the sports card grading and flipping aspect of it, like you could get to like seven, eight grand a month profit. After that, it gets a little bit difficult, but doing both because the sports betting arbitrage takes a matter of 20 minutes a day. So why not? So that's your answer, Carlos. Austin says, who is your top five NBA players you're trying to buy right now? So you want to know my top five NBA players to buy right now? I'll give it to you. The answer is none of them. Please, for the life of me, do not buy any NBA players. You're going to see 
Hey, let me show you. Let me uh, let me share my screen here and show you, Carlos, what I'm exactly talking about. All right. I think I used this example in the other uh, in the podcast before. All right. This is a card of C.J. Stroud. This is a silver prism PSA 10 football. The way sports cards works is. When a season starts, most guys go down in value because they're inflated, they're hyped, their people are excited. And their value, the value of their, their cards is just like, the best way to put it is if a card is selling for $500, it's, it might only be worth like 300 or 400 but it's bumped up 20 30% just because of inflation and hype. So if you have a player that comes out and plays solid, a lot of the times you'll see their cards go down in value. Look at this card of CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud is having a pretty solid year, right? We could agree on that. And you can see this silver prism PSA 10 was like 820, 870, right in that range. And look what it is today. Look what it sells for today, right? 600. And he's playing well, right? It's down like 25%. So you're going to see this happen in basketball, right? So if we go to like a good example of this is Wembenyama silver prism PSA 10. So this is a bold, bold prediction here. <laughs> and I could regret saying this because... When I say things that are wrong, I, I get attacked. But anyways, this silver prison PS10 is like a thousand bucks, and for some reason it's went down to like eight fifty. Now, if I could bet money that this card would be worth twenty percent less in you know a month from now, I'd bet a lot of money. If there was a way to short sports cards, I would do it, especially Victor Weminyama, because his value is inflated and hyped. So, none. None is the answer. Um, Jason asks, who's the best new rookie in football? Uh, are you talking in terms of, like, sports card values? Because a few of their rookie cards are coming out. Well, instead of me guessing, why don't we just look? I mean, I, I, know, uh, I, know, I know the answer is going to be... Um, Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams, but let's see what they're selling for. So they just had some of their uh, cards come out, their XRC selects. These are like, in my opinion, the first like good football cards. Let's just look it up. XRC, Jaden Daniels. What's it? 2023. Let's see. Let's see what this is selling. for. Oh my goodness gracious. You see what those are selling for? Crazy. All right. Let's look at a sold item. So Jaden Daniels, a PSO raw. There's going to be not a lot of 10 sales. Raw does like 900, 1100, 900. Yeah, call it like 900. And the only person that would match him would be Caleb Williams. But I could tell you for a fact, this card is going to be worth much less in a few months. So Caleb Williams is like 700. So Jaden Daniels sells for more. But like, check this out. I just want to show you how crazy this is. Like why when new cards come out, you can't buy them. Watch this. XRC Stroud. Let's look this up. A CJ Stroud XRC does. I don't know if they, I don't know if that sales real. Does like yeah, like 800, 900. PSA nine's like five hundred. Wow, they really dip a lot. So you're gonna sit here and tell me that Caleb Williams and CJ Stroud, uh, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels sell for about the same as CJ Stroud? Come on, that's crazy. You're, you'll see their values come down like 30%, 40% usually. I mean, it doesn't always happen, but usually. That's just craziness. Don't even get me started with like sports card values when they first come out. They're just fucking nuts. That's why when new cards come out, you can't buy them no matter who the player is because most guys just drop down in value. It's just how it goes. Like Just to show you another example here. If you look at, so we're right, we're looking at this card of um, Victor Weminyama. Check this out. This is crazy. So, all right, so if you go to his raw cards, right? So his cards came out right around here. All right. So his raw, actually, if we go to all, all data, let's see. Yeah. So his raws, when they first came out, were like, I don't know, six, seven hundred dollars and they went all the way up to like a thousand nine hundred dollars. They spiked, but like right, they're worth like four forty today. And I've seen much worse. I've seen guys drop down in value in in the half. So when new cards come out, you just can't buy them. They're just too hyped, too excited, and you could play the game of buying it hyped and 
inflated, but just getting one of the first PSA 10s back and selling and making a quick buck. I once had a student. He actually used to be a coach of ours. His name was Skylar Brown. And Julio Rodriguez, what was his, his top series? When they first came out, like Julio Rodriguez, it was 20... 21 or 22 something like that when they first first came out it was like four or five hundred dollars raw and like two thousand dollars as a psa 10 and skyler wanted to start buying them and i, I was like oh, i don't know man that's pretty risky you should wait because that 500 hundred dollar raw card is going to come down to like 300 anyways he bought like 10 of them nine out of 10 greater than 10 and he sold all of them. He bought them all for about four to five hundred, and he sold them all for two thousand dollars. Just about. He made almost ten grand on just like nine or nine or ten Julio Rodriguez cards. I still remember that. It was crazy. And now, and those cards, like a few months after he sold them, were like eight hundred or a thousand. So you could do that game, but that's a, I don't. And Skyler was one of our best students. He was making like five six grand a month with cards profit as it was. So. That's why I kind of said to him, you could if you want. I still wouldn't, but um, it's an interesting way to make money. All right, got some other stuff to talk about. Some This is not sports card related. Actually, I do have a few others, one other sports card related thing. So someone was, someone was asking me about the best card shows. I'm going to give you my opinion on the best card shows and like what I think are the best ones. So the way I view card shows... I go to card shows usually to buy. I buy at shows and I like to sell on social media. That's just what I like to do. So, and I buy bigger, higher end stuff. So the bigger shows are better for me. They're usually not better for most people, okay? Usually the local ones are where you're going to find good deals. But in my opinion, in terms of just like volume, activity, higher end cards, the best show is the National, which is at the end of July. That's number one. Number two, and this is where people may not agree with me, I think Chicago is the second best show, the Chicago Sports Spectacular. It's usually in March and November. Number three after that is the Burbank Card Show, which is actually in Anaheim, California. That's in February and August, usually, I believe, or maybe September. That one is really good. I've only been to it once, though, but I've just always heard good things, and the time I was there was really good. Number three, and this is probably the last big show, is the Dallas show. I haven't been there in like a year or so, but it kind of got like, when at first the Dallas show got big, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Dallas card show got big during the pandemic because Texas was the only place you could have a card show. And there was never a card show in Dallas before. And people were just so like tired of being at home. The card show just went crazy. The first one right away. I remember the first one. It was fucking nuts. The first one, it was during the pandemic when like everything was just going wild. And a Trey Young Silver Prism PSA 10, I walked into that show on Friday. It was like $1,000. I walked out of that show. The same card was selling for $3,000. Makes no sense. And the market like that is not sustainable. But that's how that show kind of got big. And that show is actually in Allen, Texas, which is like 25 minutes away from the city of Dallas. But that it is it is a good show. But over time, it just kind of got like worse and worse, in my opinion. Maybe I was just having bad experiences and just not buying as much. It started out really good and then just kind of like got slightly, slightly worse. And those are the bigger shows. There are some other big ones I haven't been to. One of them is called Mi Monsters of the Midway or something like that in Indianapolis, I believe. That one I have not been to, but I'm sure is pretty good. Another one I used to go to, I forget what it was called. But I only went there once, and it was incredible. It was in the Wisconsin Dells. I don't think they do the show anymore. I don't think. But I went there, and it was incredible. And the mac and cheese was incredible, too, because they got really good cheese over there. So those are the big, the good big shows, in my opinion. And then local shows, you can't go wrong. I mean, a local show, you're not going to... You know, it's not going to be crazy cards there, but you could find like nice raw stuff to get graded. And if you think about it, right, if you go to a show and you go there for an hour and you buy two cards and, you know, each one's 200 bucks and they both get a 10 and, you know, you make $400 profit total. That's a good deal, right? You go to a show for an hour, two hours, you drive there, you made a few hundred dollars. That's pretty good money. So that's how you need to think about shows because they're just usually if you do them right, there's such a positive return on your time. You're actually only there for X amount of hours. 
unless you're traveling, of course, then there's some other expenses and time, but you make really good money because all it takes is a few cards. All it takes is one deal and it makes the whole entire show worth it. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, um, and that's what I got for the questions. And then I got some other stuff, just some other stuff that happened through my week that I think is interesting. So I was listening to a video of Alex Hermosi, and I think this is a great quote. I don't know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But if you want to be successful, right, you have your 9 to 5 job, then you also have your 5 to 9 job, right? So you have your 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., then from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., you need to be working, right, if you want to hit, like, the next level of success. Now, with sports... With sports cards, you don't need to do that. It takes like an hour a day and you can be pretty successful. But people, and Alex Hermosi was talking about this, right? If you want to achieve not normal results in life, right? Like going on more vacations or buying a nicer car or quitting your job, whatever it is, you have to take not normal measures. And when you take not normal measures, people think you're crazy and they make fun of you. Just like when I was first started buying and selling sports cards, I can't tell you, my own damn parents were like, you're an idiot. And my friends were like, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Now, I didn't know it would come to this, to be honest with you. I just was doing it because I liked the idea of making money. It was fun. I liked sports cards. And then just, and I knew I, I knew I had some sort of entrepreneur in me because my first business was in sixth grade. I actually was performing magic shows. I'm pretty good at magic. I'm, I was performing magic shows and assisted living facilities and just like making my own money was just like thrilling and exciting. So it was new, like I had some entrepreneur in me. And then when I got an internship, like a financial analyst internship, that really like sparked a fire under my ass. It really showed me how much I hated working for people. But the point I'm trying to make is not normal life. You have to take not normal measures. And if you want to retire at 65 and have your 401k and live that normal life, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But the people I speak to and most people, right, you want to make that extra money. You may want to quit your job. Everyone, everyone wants more time freedom, right? But having time freedom and being able to do what you want, you have to take not normal measures and take, for example, myself. So it took years and years to get here. And I'm not saying this to brag, but this weekend I was at a business convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. So we flew from Tampa to Scottsdale. When we were in Scottsdale on Friday, the Mets won game five. So there's game six in Los Angeles. So we're, my buddy and I, who I was with, we were like, fuck it. Let's go to the game. So we just flew up to Los Angeles. Uh, Mets lost. It was pretty depressing. And then we took a red eye back home to Tampa. I don't do the stuff like that that often because honestly, I'm kind of burnt out from traveling. I've traveled too much in my life. But that is an example of time freedom. But the only way I was able to get there was by taking not normal activities. And I got made fun of for years, right? I got made fun of for years buying and selling sports cards. And then when I started Major League Profits, people were like, you're an idiot. What are you doing? No one's ever going to pay to learn how to make money with sports cards. When I first, all right, this is crazy. And you guys definitely don't remember this. But the first ad we ever ran for Major League Profits was a picture of me and Gary V by like a sports card booth. We were like, smiling i was like taking a selfie and it got like overnight like a thousand comments and like every comment was like who is this guy you're an idiot no one's ever gonna give you money for this blah 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 blah. right so but you have to be able to endure that because you have to be able to realize if you're investing into yourself most people don't do that people don't like change people don't like discomfort and people also get jealous of others when they're ambitious and pushing for success. You have to factor all those things in because when you invest into yourself, whether it's sports cards or whatever, you're going to get made fun of. I guarantee it. Take take my word for it. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, some other things. While we're on this topic of my life and um, – and like what's happened to my journey. Someone asked me, what's the most I've ever made on a sports card? So this is, I'm going to share with you the most I've made on a sports card, the highest percent profit I've ever made on a sports card, and just the most amount of, yeah, those two. So the most I've ever made on a sports card was like just about $40,000. It was the 2022 National Card Show. 
And how the deal came about was super weird. I was at the end of the card show. It was in Atlantic City. It was at the National Card Show. And I had a friend text me, hey, I have a buddy that just got a Justin Herbert number to 99 National Treasures graded. Do you want to buy it? And I knew I can get a decent deal because I know those cards have huge, huge margins. If you're able to grade one of those in 9.5, which is what he did, you're into it for very cheap. So this guy owned a card shop in Cleveland. I met up with him in the Tropicana Hotel in Atlantic City at like 11 p.m. And we did a deal. I gave him like a little bit of cards and mostly cash. But he bought this card for $40,000 from someone that walked into his shop. He then sent it to Beckett. Beckett graded it a 9.5. I then gave him about, about $70,000, mostly cash, some trade. Then I knew the card was worth like 90 to 100. And during the pandemic, Herbert cards, they were nuts. They were insane. They were crazy. Like it was wild. And I brought it to the show and I had a friend who's a big Justin Herbert collector who has a lot of money, gave me $110,000 in cash. So I bought it, got it for about 70 the night before. The next morning, sold it for 110. So that's the most amount of money, like absolute money, about $40,000 I ever made on a card. The highest percent profit I ever made on a card, and this was lucky. So it was a 2018 Sensational Signatures black and gold Trey Young number to five. I believe it was a number to five. And I bought this card on eBay right before Trey Young stuff blew up. So go back earlier, earlier in the podcast. Remember how I was talking about? Trey Young Silver Prism PSA 10s that the Dallas Card Show went from $1,000 to $3,000 in a weekend. So about a month and a half or two months before that card show, I bought a Trey Young, this Trey Young card. It was a BGS 9. It had 9.5 everythings for the subgrades, except that at 8.5 surface. And I was like, oh, I crack these cards all the time, clean them, send them. And I was like, let me send it to PSA. I only, this is the first card I actually ever sent to PSA. The first six years or whatever, being in sports cards, I only use Beckett. Beckett was like the place, okay? So I sent it to PSA, and PSA during the pandemic took forever, like forever to get back to me, uh, just for everybody. But I bought this card September about, got it graded. It came back to me in like November or December, and it graded a PSA 10. And I sold it, so it was all trade, but it was all like mega liquid cards. And I bought the card for, you could probably find it on eBay if you go way back to like 2022, or 2021, I think it was. <clears throat> so I bought the card for about 2100 on eBay. It cost me a few hundred dollars to get it graded by PSA. And they gave it a 10 and I moved it for trade $25,000. Yeah, I know that doesn't happen. <laughs> but that's the highest percent I've ever made on a card. I guess I about 12 times my money. So about 1200%, which is pretty wild. I mean, I just got, honestly, I got really lucky <laughs> that PSA took like an extra month or two because Trey Young stuff for whatever reason just started to go crazy. So that's cool. Um, and I was at this event this weekend. So for those of you guys who think coaching programs are a scam, let me tell you something. They're not because I've grown this business you see here today to 30 plus employees and multiple seven figures and revenue. And it was everything I've learned is from coaching programs, right? How to market, how to sell, how to like structure your program, how to get people to be successful at the highest rate, all that stuff. And one of the best programs I'm in is by a guy named Cole Gordon. And to be in this program, it cost me $68,000 a year. Expensive, I know. But it makes me more money than I pay him. The value you learn is infinite, right? Because once I gain a skill and I understand something, I have it with me for life. And you learn a lot in there. And he has some, He has three events a year in this program, in this mastermind, whatever you want to call it. And uh, two of them are in Scottsdale. One of them is in Cabo. And this weekend, I was at an event in Scottsdale, like I just talked about. And what was crazy is, so I was always the smallest fish at this event in terms of my business. Now, Major League Profits is like, or like myself at this business, my buddy and I went, we're like one of the top businesses in terms of how much money we make. And it, it was crazy because <laughs> when you... Like the way these events work, like when no one knows who you are, no one wants to talk to you. When people hear about how much money you're making, it's like all of a sudden people are coming up to you like, hey, can you help me with this? How'd you do this? I heard you learned this. And most people in business, and I learned this from, honestly, so I learned this from Alex Ramosi, number one. And number two, I truly just enjoy helping people. Like just, I just like helping people with business and helping people with sports cards. And I went out of my way for so many people at that event 
and gave them so much free value. I would sit down with them for 15 to 20 minutes on my laptop, show them things, send them documents we use, et cetera. And one of the best cases of value, and I, I'm gonna, I'm, I know I'm about to regret what I'm about to say, but someone came up to me. He didn't want business help. He was like, hey man, I've seen your ads. He owned some other sort of online business. This guy was like probably 40 or 50 years old. He's like, my son is just getting into cards. He, he loves Pokemon. Um, can, you help, can you help him? Like, how much is your program? I was like, dude, you know what? Here's the program for free. I gave him, we have two programs, a lower end one and a higher end one. Lower end one for free, on me, go, have, tell your son, enjoy it. Have him leave me a testimonial when he's making money. Um, and I truly do believe in putting as much value out there into the world because even though I probably spent multiple hours helping different people at this event, one, it's the right thing to do. Two, I enjoy helping people. And three, it will make me more money in the long run. There will eventually be a day where one of these people I helped, I have a question for them or I need something or they refer me to a friend who pays me for a massive consulting deal, even though I don't do those, or gets me on some huge podcast or something. So I'm telling you, man, or woman, whoever's listening to this, giving as much value as possible, right thing to do, and it makes you more money. Take my word for it. Okay, so got that out of the way. And one of the biggest things, actually, so like, actually, no, I did not get that, did not get that out of the way. One of the biggest things I've learned in business, especially like the major league profits, like one of the biggest things we've done to scale the shit out of our business is what you're looking at right now. Like posting more content and giving out more value for free. Like, like I just said, right? The more value you put out there into the world, the more money you make, whether it's sports cards and giving people good deals, whether it's what I'm doing right now and getting on podcasts or I guess it's my own podcast and just giving as much free value as possible. Because once we started posting this content that you're looking at right now and pushing it out, we we're getting so many people interested because what happens, at least in the world of marketing, right? You might see an ad for me. And, you know, when people see ads, they get skittish. They're like, ah, is that a scam? Is that not a scam? And when people go to my YouTube or my Instagram and they see, whoa, this person actually gives a shit and knows what he's talking about, they buy from you, right? So because I put out more value, they buy from us. Now they buy from us. We make them more money. Then they buy from us again, right? So giving out as much value, I'm telling you, it is the way to do business, the way to do life. It makes you a good person. Take my word for it. I am living proof. And going back to some, when I was talking about that Alex Ramosi stuff, he, so he quoted Charlie Munger. Um, Charlie Munger, if you don't know who he is, he was the um, Warren Buffett's like business partner. Did not, he's not as famous, but he was Warren Buffett's business partner with, with Berkshire Hathaway. And he had a famous quote, uh, compounding is the eighth great one or the eighth wonder of the world. So he quoted that. Then also, he quoted something Steve Jobs used to do. So Steve Jobs at his big board meetings or his like big, some executive meetings or whatever, he was, he was famous for saying to people, what have you said no to recently? What does that mean? Check this out. People get like fucked themselves up so much with shiny object syndrome, right? Let me tell you something from someone who, has been in business for a while, right? Everything works. Garbage business, sport or sports cards, janitor, cleaning business, whatever. Everything works. You just have to force it to work. So this is what happens with business, right? You start here. It's called uninformed optimism, right? You're like, oh, like, I don't know anything, but I think sports cards, I can make a lot of money, right? So you start with uninformed optimism. And then you realize you actually have to put work in and maybe you didn't make as much money as you'd like at first. And down down you go, and now you are at what's called the valley of despair. You're down here. You went from here to here. You're like, ah, shit, I've been doing this for a month. I haven't made any money. You know, I'm going to go back and try something new because comic books must be the answer, stamps or whatever. So you start out at ground zero again, and little did you know, if you just stuck with it a little bit longer, this graph would start going up, and then you'd have informed optimism. You'd be informed and actually have the skill and realize and be optimistic that this thing actually works. But what people do, they have uninformed optimism. They're like, yes, this is the next best thing. And then they realize it's more work than they think. 
And right before they're about to get to this next level and the graph's about to go up, boom, they start over again. And they just keep that vicious cycle over and over again. So many people do it. I'm telling you. So many people. Um, <clears throat> and piggybacking off of that, and I think this is just, what I'm about to say, I think is just so, so, so valuable. And you're never gonna hear, you're never gonna hear anybody say this. Having multiple income streams is stupid and dumb. It's dumb. It is dumb. It is dumb. It is dumb. You need to focus on one thing and be really, really good at it. Okay. Look at the richest people in the world. Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos. What all? Well, what, what did he do? He just focused on Amazon. Elon Musk, right? Well, he split his attention. That's rare. Bill Gates, Microsoft. Multiple income streams is the stupidest, dumbest thing in the world. Because you, if, you, if you want multiple income streams, multiple businesses, you have to divert your focus, okay? And what happens when you divert your focus, you make... So, like, let's say you have two businesses. Let me give you an example. You have two businesses, and they each make you $2,000 profit a month. It, and you spend 50% of your time on each. Well, if you took 100% of your time here, you, you wouldn't make 4,000, you'd make 10 or 15 or 20. That's how business works. Having multiple income streams is one of the dumbest things ever, okay? And when I say income streams, I mean a business, like an actual business, like flipping sports cards or flipping real estate. Trying to do multiple things is you're just diverting attention, you're diverting focus, and it's only gonna cost you money, I can promise you, okay? Um, so trust me, whatever you do, stick with it, stay focused. And that graph I just talked about, the uninformed optimism, when you get to the valley of despair and you realize it's hard and you haven't made, it, made any money and you're like, fuck, this may not work. That's when you stick with it because that's when 99% of people quit and they go back to uninformed optimism. I see it all the time. It happens all the time. Trust me. Um, and I'll leave it off with this. So this is interesting. I was having a conversation with a friend, right? So I was speaking to this beautiful girl. We went on two dates. And this girl, uh, we hit it off really well. She was gorgeous, just seemed cool. I mean, I didn't know her that well, but she seemed cool. And she texted me when I landed on Monday morning. We were supposed to hang out Monday night. And she was like, you know what? You know, you know what girls do, right? My emotions aren't there, blah, blah, blah. But she, it's just her way of saying she doesn't want to see me again for whatever reason. And she's a resident in med school, okay? And her mental state, I don't think, is all there because they put you through hell, it seems like. I mean, all day, you're just telling people, you know, you have cancer and it seems very negative and you're working 12 hours a day in this brutal hospital. God bless you medical workers because I don't know how you do it. And I was speaking with my friend, uh, just a female, a female friend, and she asked me, she was like, um... Are you still talking to this girl? And I was like, no. She, um, you know, she said she didn't want to hang out anymore. <clears throat> she said her emotions aren't there and she wants to talk in the future. But right, that's just a way of saying that she just doesn't want to see me again. And I said to this girl, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I want to I want to go back to the drawing board and see what went wrong. What did I do? Maybe I didn't communicate enough. Like, in my opinion, I probably didn't communicate that well because I was away um, for a few days and didn't really text <laughs> probably not the thing probably not the thing to do and my friend who I was telling this to I was like yes yeah, like I want to see like where I went wrong and she was like why are you putting so much blame on yourself like why are you being so harsh on yourself and to me that's just what I do like as a business owner and something that's helped me out so much in life whether something's your fault or not you do not gain anything you don't grow at all you don't gain anything from pinning blame on someone else like this girl example, sure, I could say that she is not in the right mental state and whatever. I can make up some excuse as to why she didn't want to talk to me again. But whether it's true or not, I don't care because if I just say, oh, yeah, she was just mental, mentally wasn't there, I gain nothing, right? I want to see, like, what did I do wrong, right? Did I not communicate well enough? Did I say something wrong? Who knows, right? But you gain nothing by blaming others. Even if it's their fault, you still gain nothing. As a business owner and to grow as a person, always blame yourself. If I have an employee that curses out a student, it's never happened, but pretend it did, 
sure, I'm going to talk to the employee, but I'm going to blame myself. Maybe my SOPs and documentation in my business of how to speak to students and how to communicate isn't good enough because sure, that employee sh should just know not to curse at a student, but I blame myself because I did not properly teach him. And that's why something went wrong. Just like this girl, like, who knows? Maybe, like, maybe she's talking to another guy, right? That's definitely possible. But like, still at the end of the day, I want to grow from it. I want to say, how could I be better, right? And having that frame of mind, one, you gain a lot of respect from people. And number two, you grow as a person. It makes you more money. It makes people respect you. Um, little life hack. And it's easier said than done because like so many people just want to pin blame on other people, but you just get nothing from it. It makes you feel good. Uh, you know, I should say it makes you feel good for about five minutes, pinning blame on other people. So I'll, I'll leave you guys off with that. <clears throat> but if you do like this stuff, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. If you like this stuff, maybe that's my body telling me I shouldn't shut down the podcast, but I have other stuff to do today. So I have to. But if you do like this stuff on YouTube, if you're watching, leave a comment. I try to reply to my comments as much as possible. And if you're watching this and you like this podcast, I'll put a link somewhere up here to another podcast you might enjoy if you like this one. But like I said, if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.